Okay, I've got 530. So we will get started. I, um, I'm sure Humera and Tara will join us as soon as they can. But we do have a quorum. So let's get going. Uh, welcome everyone to the March 8th, I can't believe it's March already, <laughs> 2021. Uh, Hadley Public Schools uh, School Committee meeting. Is there a motion um, uh, to call the meeting to order? I moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any adjustments to the agenda tonight, Annie? It will not be going into executive session. We do not require an executive session at the end of the meeting. Ooh, okay. That sounds good. Um, good. So we will. Uh, open for public comment now, uh, and I'll give folks, I know we still have a couple of folks still joining us, and there's nobody in the waiting room. Uh, again, for public comment, if you uh, look in your participants pane, sometimes that's where it is in terms of raising a digital hand. Uh, sometimes it's at, the, it's at the bottom of your toolbar in terms of a reaction or just being able to raise your digital hand if you would like to speak during public comment. And hi, Humera, thanks for joining. And um, if you'd like to speak for public comment, please raise your digital hand and we can call on you uh, to hear your public comment. I'll just pause and give folks a chance to uh, find that button if you would like to speak. While people are doing that, Heather, Tara did tell me uh, that she may be running a little bit late, so. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, nobody is wait in the waiting room and I see no requests for public comments. So we will move forward. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Much appreciated. Uh, we're gonna move into our presentation and discussion items. The first one being the overview of changes to Hopkins Academy program of studies for the 21 to 22 year, April. Thanks, it's nice being able to talk about something that's not quite COVID related, as much as I know we enjoy that. Our departments have been working very hard on our program of studies. So I did want to go over a few of the changes we made and try to highlight some in particular that you might have questions about or be interested in um, more so than things like just changing the school year and, and the editing for punctuation and things of that nature. So this fall, we worked with teachers in order to analyze the program of studies with a lens for equity and inclusion. In doing so, we did find that there were a few areas of concern uh, one of those had just to do with basic organization and ease of access. We also had concerns about a lack of visuals or other methods for students to sort of understand their trajectory in terms of what they were taking. We had some conversations about the GPA weighting and leveling of courses, as well as um, some lack of information because we've had, as you know, some new programs over the last couple of years. So we wanted to update all of those different things. So in terms of the organization, we added some hyperlinks to the program of studies to try to make the document a little bit more active and helpful to people. It is kind of long, so it can help to take them through some different areas that they're looking for. Each department also added a visual uh, as well as possibly a four-year course offering trajectory so that students could plan as to what would be happening in the future as they're thinking about courses they wanted to take. That's particularly important for students who are looking at the innovation pathways because they do have to take specific courses, not necessarily in a, in a specific order, but they do have to make sure that they get them all checked off in order to have that certification for those programs. We added some course descriptions for Innovation Pathways, Early College High School. We also added descriptions for MICAP and the Civics Project, which is a newer law as well. And we updated the MCAS requirements. That's not a change on our end. It was the, the change from the old language of uh, proficient to meeting expectations and the corresponding numbers. So that was a sort of simple, quick update. We had a lot of conversations around the GPA, what would be included in that and what the scale should be. So this is kind of one of the bigger changes that we made. We had a 5.0 or almost 5.0 weighted scale. And after looking at what colleges do in local districts, we did decide to change that to a 4.0, but we did have the weighting still for honors and AP. However, instead of having a separate weight for honors and AP, we did the same weight for the two of those. Since we're such a small school, 
not every department has both honors and AP courses or an even number of those. Some might only have honors or only have AP. So we did wanna make sure that students were able to, to get credit for both of those things. We also thought it was important that students were able to have courses that they took that weren't the traditional core courses included in their GPA. So students who might be interested perhaps in going into the arts, for example, the courses that they were taking are not currently included in their GPA. And we felt uh, pretty unanimously as a faculty and staff that those should be. So we did make that change as well. Um, that, you can see that in the language where it describes like the O2 and the O3 and the O4 courses as well. And then we added in some language about how many credits a student can take in a year. This was sort hey, of- I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your papers are on your laptop on sorry. the microphone. So <laughs> it's just hard to hear you when you're flipping. Thank you. Sorry, no, I moved them. Um, so the one of the last pieces I wanted to highlight too was that we looked at how many credits a student can take and we did put some language in around that. So we wanted to make sure that students didn't, um, we were trying to keep it as equitable as possible. So there was a concern both about students adding extra courses to their transcript because they have an opportunity and access to resources that others don't, as well as a concern about students not taking a full course load as well. So we just sort of followed the practice that we've always done and we just put that into language. So it's not anything different than what we've usually done registering students for a specific number of courses. We did just add that in and it does add up to uh, what they need to have overall as well. And then I know you guys have the breakdown of some specifics of new courses that were added as well. So there are a few new courses. For example, there's a middle school oceanography class. There's also a middle school course in French culture that we are offering. Um, I mentioned some of the other changes a month or two ago as well in terms of American literature, for example. So we changed regular American literature and ethnic American literature to early American literature and modern American literature to have that be more inclusive. So there's a few differences around that. And then of course, the sort of usual making sure that our course numbers line up with the data system accurately and just making sure that all the other pieces weren't missing. Oh, one other thing that's pretty cool that Ms. Sear added that I think is worth pointing out is a transcript analysis. So we wanted to have kind of a one sheet of all, our, all of the courses as well as a sheet for students to be able to say, this is what I need and this is what I've taken and this is where I still need to be to help monitor that for themselves. So a big part of what we're doing with MyCap is making sure that students are planning ahead and thinking about what it is that they need to take, not just to complete their requirements at Hopkins, but also in thinking about their future college and career. So we try to add different components that would help them to do some of that reflective thinking and tracking with their MyCap advisors and others as well. So I think those are all of the big things. It is a long document and there are, there are a lot of things in there. So I'm happy to take specific questions about anything, it doesn't have to be the things that I mentioned, I just tried to highlight some of what was changed. Not a question for me, but I, I really appreciate the transcript planning piece. And I think as much, um, you may already have this in mind, but kind of hooking that into the planning for coverage of courses. I know it seems like every year at the end of the year, kids make the requests of their courses. And then towards the beginning of the year, we shuffle around just because of you know small classes and, and some limitations, right? So as much as that may be able to help with advanced planning, that'll be great. Yeah, I think related to that too, what helps is of course, innovation pathways are newer, but again, there are certain courses that we do have to offer. And so even if it's only three kids in AP Chem, we do need to make sure that we have ways for students to take these courses that we've set up for these programs. So being able to sort of look at that and track that in those uh, couple of different areas, I think will be helpful. And kids can see that too, because now they can see in the program of studies, if I am going to do the life science pathway, here are all the courses I need to take, plus I have to do an internship, plus I have to do the capstone. And so that's all outlined for them. April, can I ask a question? And I don't know if this is the place for it, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, and, and okay. you can tell me. Um, for the AP and honors courses, um, there's, there's not a consistency in terms of what a student 
the the prerequisites, kind of the grade that they need to get. Some's a B, some are a B minus, some are a C. Um, is there is that was what was the thinking behind that? And is there a reason why it's not kind of just level across the board? Yeah. Those were revised a couple of years ago. We didn't make any changes to those in this year, but we did a couple of years ago. And I know that when they were decided at that time, each department decided how, like what that was going to be. They all say a grade and or teacher recommendation or approval so that the grade itself isn't a strict barrier, but each department decided alone and, and we did not update any of those this year. Thank you. I would suggest that maybe it's something to look out for the next year, April. Um, it is a topic that came up in uh, the reading of Despite Best Intentions about AP classes in general and about student access to them. And if we're, um, if we're putting up barriers to students who might decide that, okay, this is a pathway I wanna go down, um, yet some students are able to get in because of advocacy or exceptions, it just feels like it's a, it may be inequitable. It has the ability to be inequitable, especially if it's dependent on a, a personal judgment on the mm -hmm. part of a previous educator. So I would suggest that we take a strong heart look at that. Any other comments or questions? Just two points, April. One is thanks for getting rid of the weighted five or GPA, that was just as a father of a son applying to college, that was always a bear. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And then just looking through the, the program of studies, the number of courses offered, the different pathways, the different opportunities for such a small school, it's really, really impressive. So good work. It's, and I know it's a shout out to all the, the teachers out there, but it's just really, I want to take a bunch of these classes. It, it looks great. So thanks. I, I would, don't think I would have said that in high school, but now I, I'll say it. So. I appreciate it. No, I think a lot of the kids do as well. I, we do try to offer as much as we can, even in a small school. And the teachers are always great about coming up with new courses and curriculum, taking on new programs. And, you know, they want Hopkins to be as, as great as it can. I should say the changes, as you guys should know, but in case anyone else is listening, to the GPA and the transcript won't impact this year's students. This is for next year. So they'll still see theirs as they do. And it gets readjusted, as you know, for college anyway. Um, but just in case anyone's wondering about that, that is for next year and not for this year, including what's added into the GPA as well. Yeah, I agree with Paul's comments in terms of <laughs> applying for colleges, but also the, the course offerings. And I was glad to see VHS in there still as a, you know, a viable alternative um, because, you know, bottom line, they're able to offer some things that we just may not be able to offer that would be um, of interest to kids on a particular pathway. April, uh, just a one more question. Do we do we rank uh, our class? We do. Okay. And has there been any thought given to doing away with ranking in, in the future? Uh, I have not, I guess, considered that. No one's brought it up. Um, I guess we could certainly have a conversation about it. I know there are certain scholarships and things that use that ranking, so I don't know how that would impact that. Um, but th currently there hasn't been a conversation. Thanks. Hi, Tara. Are you able to come off mute? Okay, good. Yes. We just Hi. to make sure we can hear you if we... <laughs> If you wanted to unmute, great. Sorry, I'm late. Hi, everybody. No, no worries. Um, Annie, let us know. We're just discussing the overview of changes to the program of studies. Great. Did you have anything you wanted to mention on that, Tara? Um, I don't. I don't actually think so. Okay. And uh, Ethan, I'll just mention April. Um, you're right. There are scholarship applications that do ask for that class ranking, if known. Um, so sometimes you can get around it, just leaving it blank. One thing that, um, that I um, wanna say is I, I think that um, having a minimum course load 
credit makes a lot of sense. The maximum on the other hand, for a student who wants to enjoy some of the opportunities we're making available to us, um, that doesn't make as much sense to me, putting a cap on some, you know, a lot of things that are oftentimes fixed expenses to us and could accommodate a student willing to take an extra class. Um, so I think I will just register my, um, my lack of approval for that. So Humira, with that, um, is the thinking that I mean, there are some sometimes it's a feasibility concern, right? In terms of you just can't fit another one in the day. But is it more that if something were offered that could be fit within the, the time? Absolutely. And if you consider the fact that we're now offering um, Greenfield Community College classes and students can actually take those classes at other times of day that do not conflict with, Hopkins Academy classes, you might be asking them to choose between a class that sounds interesting with their friends and at the school and taking this uh, extra opportunity. And I'm not saying that it's for every student. God knows that there's, you know, some of my kids, I would, I'm like just lucky that they will take the bare minimum. Uh, but if you have a student who's really willing and excited you know, and I can think of a number of students who have gone through the Hopkins Academy system over the last several years who would have been completely capable. Why would we want to put a cap on that? I don't see how that is. Um, I don't see that that is in the best interests of our students. Is that something that could be, and I just, I don't know the history of it um, now that obviously things have evolved in terms of offerings and times of day, is that something that can be um, permit, you know, with permissions? I mean, I wonder to what extent that becomes arbitrary and um, you know, like person specific. So yeah, I mean, everything in that paragraph is like by exception, but Right. Again, I mean, it just leaves it to the judgment of people and a student and how, you know, yeah. I guess I would just say that the thinking is that there's nothing that prevents a student from submitting their own extra transcript of courses that they've taken, but that our goal is to keep our transcript, which we control, to be as equitable as possible for students. And some students have more access to opportunities and resources, even if it's just that they're able to have the time to take an extra course because they don't have to work a job. And so when we talked about it as a leadership team, we felt like making sure that it was the same for all students would be most equitable. And they could certainly submit, as they do all of the time, their own resume or transcript for anything else that they do that's above and beyond. I can understand that applying to anything that a student would take outside of Hopkins purview. But if it is something that is within Hopkins purview, like uh, the early college pathways that we fought so hard to bring into our school or um, you know, some, something else related to what we might be offering, that doesn't seem fair. That seems like a forcing them to choose. And, uh, and I, like I said, I, I believe in limits. I do, I, and I, it's not for every student, but if I look at some of the really um, hardworking students who would be completely capable, I, I don't know that I'd wanna put a limit on their potential. I do know that the current expectation for early college high school is that it is taken within the school day. We did have to design time where it could be within the school day. So I, I would certainly have to look into that more to, to see again what the expectations were around early college high school. I'm not sure that it's the expectation that they would take a full course load plus another course in the evening, but I would, I would have to check uh, with the team who's been working on that. That's good feedback. And any other points needing clarification? Okay, um, is this, this is not an action item. This was informational for us. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I mean, it would be good to understand that. Kind it of actually is an action item. Right 
I'm sorry, Heather, it is, is it? an item. Yeah, approval of the program of studies. Oh, I see it now. I apologize. Okay, are there any other clarifications or questions um, at this point? Or I guess I'll ask Humera, do we need to hold on this given the one point that you said uh, you'd like? I, mean, I, I, I'm thinking back to uh, my oldest who's taking the early college pathway, the career, you know, Greenfield Community College classes. Um, two of them were asynchronous. So there was no time that he'd have to carve out during the school day in order to take that. He was taking that whenever he wanted. And one of them was outside of the school hours. Um, so I just don't know that it's, I think the issue still remains. Um, and like I said. Humer, how does that, so are, and just so I get this straight, you're basically, you're kind of suggesting that kids should be able to take more courses if they feel they can consume them in a, in a positive way? Precisely. So I guess my question is, how is that kind of, how does that boast equity, I guess, in this moment? is like, if I take seven and you take five and I'm able to take seven every year, does that, is that, is that good for the community if I'm able to take more than other students every year? I think in, in today's day and age where these college classes are now available online and can be taken in the evening, early morning, I just feel like there's much more access to equity now using some of those opportunities. So I, I've always been a proponent of more access than less. Um, I have a harder time with like AP classes and honors classes being not equitable um, in, within the school day. Um, you know, but when you have something that is as flexible as those kinds of classes, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know why we would put a limit on it. In April, you're saying you guys discussed that in your leadership meetings? Yeah, I mean, again, we're not saying anyone can't take more credits than that. We're just talking about the Hopkins transcript. So again, our thinking is that for students who, we wanna keep that the same for all students. That way we don't have students who are able to add an extra 30 credits to their transcript from us to say, hey, look at all these things I've done. Uh, for somebody else who's not able to do that, we're suggesting that they submit that privately and not through Hopkins. So the the classes that our students are taking at through the early college program that we are offering at Hopkins does not end up on their transcript? It absolutely does. But that's within their course credits that they can register right. for within a year. So they don't take a course at Hopkins in like, let's say it's B block. They don't take it there. They take a GCC course instead, just like with BHS. So if a student wanted to take beyond that um, and take another GCC course um, that was offered in the evenings or, or outside of the school day, you're saying they could do that through our program of studies. However, it would show up on a GCC separate transcript. Correct. That's not the case scenario I'm talking about. I'm referring to the student who wants to take the, their, the classes that are offered at Hopkins uh, and a couple of extra classes at GCC. So still the, within the maximum that they can take at GCC and would appear on their transcript, but you're not making them forego uh, taking war literature, which was an incredible class and got rave reviews or um, you know something with a, a teacher that is really incredible at Hopkins and has like one class period that that's offered. The GCC classes are far more flexible timing wise. They don't fall within the A, B, C, D block. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so yeah. Umar, I, I have to say, I'm, I mean, I feel like I agree with the premise here of in the spirit of equitable um, presentation of information that you're trying to put all of the Hopkins transcripts on the same uh, level while allowing for separately those things that are taken outside um, through college course credits. No, not necessarily. I'm saying anything that Hopkins offers ought to be able to be offered on Hopkins's transcript, but why put a limit on what students can take? 
through Hopkins? Because then I think that the colleges will, if, if I have 30 credits and you have 22 credits, the college is going to say, why, why don't you have 30 credits to that student who took a full load and has 22 credits? And I think that's where the equity can, can be challenging at times because once you start giving kids the opportunity to take more, then does it become a rat race to take as many credits as possible to fill up a transcript and take away from the things that they should be doing out in the community? I mean, I, I hear you on that, but very rarely are two students like that ever compared again, like where our students are not competing for the same slot necessarily. And we haven't had this rule in place before. So it's not like our students have been a part of that rat race. So I'm, I still wonder sure. we are not doing our students a disservice by limiting their abilities to take them. Are you saying that students that apply to the same school from Hopkins aren't looked at together? I'm saying it appears rare in light of 20 graduating students and the like where they end up that they are ever looked at together. At, at the same school or just because they go to different schools? It, it appears as though they're not necessarily applying to the same schools. I mean, we have so few students. So they're, they're all going to different places. <laughs> I would want every one of our students to not to have every advantage. That's what I would argue for, is that if we had a student who is, um, you know, pretty, pretty capable, I look at the, like the Dwyer kids that went through our system or our valedictorian, um, Alvin Lee, um, or the Cole Safran's, if they had the ability to take an extra class, would I want to limit their potential? No, I would not want to. That's me personally. Again, uh, I, only through the classes that are offered through Hopkins. Yeah, I, I, I think I would just given kind of what I've seen over the last 15 years in the college counseling world that when you open up that gate, you're just, it's going to end up being kind of that, that rat race to take as many and as much rigor as possible. And, and, and sure, yes, like year to year, like kids aren't applying to the same schools, but if, if next year I apply with, again, with 22 credits instead of 30, you're going to be on some level compared there's going to be a question as to you know why that that student didn't take as many as the last student that came through this is like a this is a new rule i mean it, it hasn't harmed us in the past it, it is following the practice so we've never done what you're suggesting humera this is just putting into words what we've always done in practice at, at least the entire time that i've been at hopkins so students do on their own take extra classes in the summer or in the fall, that doesn't get added to the transcript. I think what you're saying in terms of early college high school, and we, we haven't ever had them fill up their schedule plus take VHS classes, um, which is also kind of what you're suggesting for early college high school. So I think what you're saying is that those would be the two places where they could take a full course load plus extra credits. And we have never historically done that so far. And again, with early college high school, I'm not sure if we can because I believe a requirement was that we had to have it within the schedule of the day or at least show that we could. So I'm not sure it's the expectation of the state that they would be taking them as extra courses, but I would have to look at that again. Um, but it, it was just putting down into, into the program of studies what it is that we've always done in practice previously. And students have just submitted those extra transcripts or resume information on their own. Oh, and I'm not suggesting that they stop doing that. I'm just suggesting that anything they take through Hopkins be able to be added to their Hopkins transcript. And that if we have the ability to allow them to do that, that we should not limit them. But that's, that's my personal stance is that if we have the ability to allow a student to take what they can and are willing to, that we should not put a limit on that. Can I ask, it, it sounds like maybe in this particular area, we need a little bit more clarification on what's allowed and what's not allowed. Because what I'm kind of understanding at all is that if we're offering something to students, what are the limitations, right? Because I get it in history, this is, you know, historically, this is what we've done, but this is something completely new. So we need to make sure that we're operating within what we're capable um, of doing under this, this new program that we have available. So if there, I, I think we need to look at what might the restrictions might be. I think I can help with that. So what early college high school, we have to make sure that 
that students are able to access these courses during the school day, because one of the principal components of early college high school is to focus on equity, which means I'm already going to school. I have to be able to access during the school day if I need to, if I have a job at night, if I have other things to do. So something that has to be a part of the school day. Now that doesn't mean the state or GCC. In some cases, as April said, it, it operates similar to virtual high school courses where there's time carved out in a student's schedule. If you pull the schedule for a student who's in a virtual high school course or in an early college high school course or in an independent study, there's time created a block in their schedule. It does not mean that they're attending because the college schedule does not perfectly match the Hopkins schedule, similar to VHS. Same thing could be with an independent study. Doesn't mean there's a, a perfect match there. I think what, Humera, what you're asking is, so if I'm a student whose early college high school course is an online course that's asynchronous or offered at a different time, I have this block now in my schedule that says GCC, but physically I don't have to be a GCC at that time. And so Humera, you're asking, well then does it make sense to say if a student has that block or the same block would be there for VHS, the same block wouldn't be the same with an independent study, but the same block could be there for VHS potentially, because that also is, I don't know if asynchronous is the right word, perhaps people you'd correct that, but it doesn't necessarily meet at the time that we've carved out in the Hopkins schedule. Um, I think that's a reasonable question. I would also say if nothing else, even if it begs additional like, so this is not deviating from what we have done historically in practice, no rap radical changes being recommended. I hear Humera, you asking, is it the practice we wanna stick with? And I'll just register my fear of maybe not, but I'm not completely, I do feel there's this niggling thing around like the transcript example that Ethan, you have given. I think what the leadership team was talking about, are we, then what, what are the worst consequences of our best thinking here? And are there certain students who for a whole host of reasons will be far more likely to walk out of Hopkins with this transcript on steroids than others? Um, and I don't, I would say, I'm not sure that we know that, but it's a, enough of a concern for me that I wouldn't necessarily just say, let's just drop that out of the program of studies. But I think it's a question to say, is there, are, is there a risk by saying, okay, if you're this student and maybe perhaps one of the ways of getting at that is students who do register for VHS or apply for early college and are part of early college or an internship in Innovation Pathway, that internship isn't gonna match a waterfall schedule at a high school, right? There's gonna be time put in a block, but it's not gonna match that if we can hear from students and, and listen to their experiences, is there something in this design that actually is preventing you from doing something that you would, you know, that you're really interested in doing? Um, and then pay attention to what we learn and what we hear. So I'm not suggesting we just kick this can down the road forever, but I would just say there's enough for me to say, I'm not sure that it wouldn't have unintentional consequences around equity. And I'll track back to your question about um, advanced placement. I, I think you register a, a really an excellent concern. Um, I know that Ms. Camuso and I have talked about this many times. I know the teachers are often talking about this. So we've had like doors wide open, then um, revisited prerequisites. But I think you, you raise an interesting point around any time that we're dependent upon individual relationships uh, to, to potentially make a decision. That's not to imply that people aren't analytical and think about it when they make a recommendation, but it does open the door for, hmm, for bias and other things. And so um, I would be curious to say, okay, let's, let's look at, and I'm in no way suggesting that it's up to the school committee, but I'm in no way suggesting holding up the program of studies because there's nothing that deviates radically from what's been in practice. Kids wanna start registering for classes in the spring. But I do think those questions, I mean, I have total faith that, that Ms. Camoso would bring those back to the team and say, um, you know, in both cases, what are, what are the unintended consequences of this particular stance? And does this stance, 
privilege some and, and disadvantage others? And how would we know? And those are excellent questions. I don't know with even the, the most in-depth discussion of school committee, I don't know that they're answerable right now. Doesn't mean they're never answerable, but I just, I think it's important to first ask the right question and then start collecting information on what those answers might be. I would be uh, willing to pass the program of studies if we commit to answering those questions oh. in a way that's student-centered. And I shouldn't step over. Is that reasonable, Ms. Camuso, in terms of I'm not part of the team that really gets in the nitty gritty with the program of studies? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think all stakeholders are important in that one. I guess I think my only... Uh, my only reservation is not to say that I don't want student student input on that, but students uh, will often do what's in their own best interest as well. And so students who want an extra 15 credits in their transcript will likely answer that that's what they would like. And students who aren't able to do that might answer that they don't, but that's just a guess. I could be completely wrong. So getting, getting their input is certainly important, but I do think that um, the staff and faculty input is also important on that one. Yeah, I, we should ask all stakeholders. I also think that there's this scenario where the student may not necessarily be doing it to load up their transcript and differentiate themselves and compete and create this rat race, Ethan, that you've described. I could see a scenario where maybe the student has to complete a fourth year language requirement or a fourth year you know, a, a specific math requirement and that prevents them from taking something that perhaps they really just you know, it's at GCC and it's something that they love, but they wouldn't be able to take that because they have to complete this school requirement. I, I just, again, I, I think putting a cap on what our students could do is, is not the way that I ra would rather look at it. I'd rather advantage every one of our students with the ability to do what they can and um, so but thank you for uh, looking into that, April. So then can we make a motion to um, approve the program of studies with the caveat that those areas just discussed would be examined for a future um, presentation? Is that reasonable? In terms of, I heard there are two issues on the table, right? The maximum amount of credits and the distinction between AP and honors. And the prerequisite, the, the sort of like, yes, the prerequisites of getting into an AP and honors the recommendation from a human uh, and the, the grade and how that's different according to each subject. Okay. Yeah, so it wasn't the distinction between AP and honors, it was the prerequisites that they are different and um, just in general. And I just, I, and maybe we can, uh, again, talk, move this down the road, but, and I don't know if this needs to be part of the conversation, but I'd love to at some point revisit the idea of rank and, and the, the benefit of it. I, I completely understand the scholarship piece, but I also, um, rank is something that I think it's, uh, my, in my opinion, blown out of proportion from time to time and um, can be something that, that gets in the way of, of equity and access as well, so. Um, that doesn't need to be part of this conversation, but if it can come up, that'd be great. Okay. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Or abstain? Okay. So um, sounds like those two pieces, April, we'll look forward to hearing just about next steps on those, but um, the rest of the program of studies looks good. Great, and Ethan, yeah, I think um, the class rank discussion, let's add that to a future uh, discussion topic. Sounds good. I don't know enough about where else it's used um, and where else it can be helpful. I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> I'm sure you, you know more about that area than I do. Okay, um, I think we're ready to move into pooled testing and instructions per, for providing consent. And as along with this, I would love to hear how the last couple of weeks have gone just in terms of return to uh, 
uh, the phase three, I should say, implementation at Hopkins, if that's okay, as far as being related to this item. Well, it's, it's certainly okay with me because it would be Ms. Camuso who would respond and you can start. <laughs> sure. uh, I don't have too much to say yet. We just welcomed back the seniors today. So that's every grade back as of today. And I would say for the most part, we maintained most of those students over the course of the days. I know that was one of the, the concerns that some of you had. We did maintain most of our students. We had our, our first real fire drill on Friday when we had the majority of them there and that seemed to go pretty well. So that was fun. And uh, tomorrow we start moving classes in middle school. So our high school students who plan on being remote during that week will go remote tomorrow and our middle school will start moving and you know we're, we're set and we're ready to go. But of course, some of it's a little bit of an experiment. So the, the teachers seem to be in a, a pretty good mindset about that, knowing that, you know, things might not go quite as planned, but they've been, you know, in all the new spaces, checking things out. And uh, so far, everything, everything seems to be going pretty well. That's great. Thank you, April. It's nice seeing them. I'll say that. I know that's not like a, a data specific data point, but it is lovely seeing them in the school and hearing them. And I see them out at mask break and it's like, oh, there's all these children talking and smiling with one another. And that's just nice to see. So hopefully it wasn't too miserable for the seniors today, but they'll be moving through their classes before they know it. April, can you comment on what percentage uh, we ended up landing at? Uh, it was the same number of students we gave last time, which I don't have in front of me again, but it was around 150. If they're all there, which again, they're not all there at that one time. I think I we have had a couple of students come in and out over the last week. So I, I would probably have to run the numbers again, uh, but not a large number. And if I recall correctly, the percentage was like 52% or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And just to follow up to on, I think our next meeting on the 22nd, you were gonna provide an update and um, it, it's reasonable to anticipate that I'm, I'm probably going to ask over the this week and next week to how many students, you know, and get that kind of percentage just to thought just so I don't put you on the spot again. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and, and that'll be more helpful um, then as well to see if we've gained more students back or lost any as well. What's hard too is that we sort of continually gain and lose those. So even over this last week, even I had a student, you know, show up Friday who uh, didn't tell us they were returning and then they were there. I had a student who emailed me last night at nine who wanted to come back. So I told them they had to wait a couple of days so we could sort out the bus and where they were going to go. So it is sort of continuously changing, but I can certainly give you the updated numbers then. And we would have gone through a round of each face-to-face. -face, so I should have some helpful information from the teacher and hopefully student perspective on that. And I'll say the same that you did, April, how nice it was to see some students. We've seen some students all year, and that's been fantastic. And there were some students who walked in today, and I thought, wow, it, we're a week away from one year since you probably walked in this building. Um, so it was delightful uh, to see people back in the building that they may not really have been learning in for almost 12 months now, next Friday, right? or this Friday, right. 12 months. So it was nice. And our pool testing. Uh, so the number of folks, thank you for everybody who has submitted your consent. Again, this is completely optional. So no staff person, no family is required or mandated to participate. But this is something the school committee talked about last summer. We started talking about testing and um, we made the commitment to the community that we would to uh, every extent possible or practical, practicable, we would make available, we would implement uh, every mitigation strategy that was available. So now that testing has become available, we are poised to implement that. As of this morning, um, the consents were sent out to all families last week and to staff. Of course, if people have any difficulty accessing those, if they would prefer a paper copy, this was indicated in the main email, folks can call me, uh, they can email me. Um, we'll make, uh, if people are having trouble, uh, we will make appointments to go through anything and help people fill out anything that they need. 
So as of this morning, we had a total of 36 staff who have indicated that they're interested in participating in the program. That represents just about 32% of our total headcount of faculty and staff. This morning, we had a total of 72 students. Now, some people, since I checked this morning to this evening, may have submitted consents. So district-wide, that's about 21% of the student body district-wide. And, um, and then at HES, the breakdown there is 39 students, 39 families have indicated, um, 39 students have indicated that they will be participating in pool testing at Hopkins Academy at 33 students. Um, and so we ordered uh, our tests. I do believe that while I was talking to Ms. Dowd on the phone this afternoon, I think the FedEx guy dropped them off uh, shortly before the school committee meeting at uh, Hadley Elementary School, and I imagine that we'll see those at Hopkins tomorrow, and then we will um, look to probably initiate our first pools of testing next week, I would imagine. It may, there may be a slight delay. We will have to work with the testing company to, um, we're going to try our best to see if we can do testing on Mondays. Um, there's a reason that school districts all try to get probably on Monday because you'll, we'll do the pool testing, we'll get the results Tuesday evening. If the pool comes back positive, the folks in that pool will come in for rapid testing on Wednesday morning. Once a positive case is isolated, that means Monday and Tuesday is the contact tracing window for school for their life in the community, their contact tracing for the positive person, their contacts have to be traced for Saturday and Sunday. So the later you go in the week, the more days there are to potentially contact trace. So we just need to work out with the testing company about when we can, which day of the week we can do, get our pool sorted, and then we'll get this underway. And people can opt in at a later time. And I do wanna remind families that, um, and our nurses will reach out to you and there'll be questions that um, our testing supervisors, uh, Ms. Ouellette and Ms. Sis will ask students and, and sometimes our nurses will be contacting families for very young students, but you cannot participate in pool testing if you have tested positive for COVID-19 in the past 90 days, in the past three months. So we don't want people in the pool for whom that's a reality. So we'll be asking, We'll be checking with families, but please families should be mindful of that as well. Annie, can you remind me, I just don't remember, um, in the elementary school, was it being offered at every grade level, including yes. K and pre-K? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, not that we don't think that our little ones in pre-K are reliable reporters, but we will probably check with parents <laughs> before we ask them their health history for the last 90 days. Annie, there were two things um, with the uh, consent form I was thinking about. One is it wasn't clear to me if, if your child is 18, whether the parents are providing the consent or if the child is, because technically they're not a minor. Um, but, and it didn't really say, the instructions were very helpful in going through it, but there may be uh, parents who filled it out for 18 year olds. I don't know if that is okay. Um, the second piece was I found the demonstration at our last meeting really helpful uh, to see visually what a test swab would look like and how just non-invasive that appeared in relation to things that we've heard and seen on the news. And I just, I wasn't sure whether you were making use of that, um, you know, in trying to either hear back from families or encourage them to, you know, learn more about it. That video is very helpful as a resource. When I send, I will occasionally remind people that they can opt in. And when I send um, a reminder, I'll ask, I'll try to clip that video from uh, the school committee, Hadley Media's recording of that school committee meeting, or just do another one too, I'm sure that, uh, Ms. Says or Ms. Willett would be happy to do that. So I can see if we can just get another one. So thank and you for everybody's um, kid, Kids asking, you know, well, what is it like? 
you know, I was like, well, they demoed it at our last meeting and it actually looked, you know, pretty simple. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm not sure whether the kids are being informed of that too, because they obviously heard, like I've heard on the news about, you know, there's a Q-tip going up to your brain and <laughs> that's not in fact the case. I also recall that we did a survey of educators and I, I want to, I want to say that the vaccinate the interest in vaccination and pool testing wasn't that about the same at around 80 percent yes the interest the right so i can't remember if we said specifically we might have said pool testing i just don't remember we might have said testing so it's very high um for both of those it was very high but i'm just i'm teasing out i'm not sure some people might have been thinking individual pcr right i'd have to look back in that survey. I think we said pool testing came out, but I'm not entirely sure. Are you going to send out a reminder? Andy? I will do that. I, Just that will. I would encourage folks to sign up, right? It's a, a free, aimless way. And the more people we have, the higher the likelihood we will have of catching something if it's in our community, so our school community. I will send a reminder. And I know some people might be testing at UMass still, which is great. We, we're definitely taking advantage of that. I would still encourage you to test here at the school too. Again, it, it should be a minute or two per child once a week. And it's free, it's painless. So I think I really encourage everybody to sign up. And I think both Alice and Willa and Robin are here. So I am going to make it possible for them to unmute themselves if they wanted to add anything. So I just... I mean, just statistically speaking, when you're looking at uh, data, the more data points you have, the more accurately, I think you're able to affirm that we are COVID free. Um, so our, our numbers, we should want to boost our numbers. So as many educators and students as possible. Yeah, I agree. And I don't know if um, Robin or Allison, if there's anything else that you wanted to add, but yeah, there's somebody. Hi, <laughs> Hi Allison. Hi. <laughs> no, and Robin's here too. I think she's uh, working her way. Um, there she is. Hi there. Hi. So um, the question, what was the question? I was confused by the question, Humera. Oh, we're just, we're, it's less a question and more a statement of statistical significance. The more data you have, the more you can be assured that COVID is not in the community. And so, whereas originally we thought that, you know, about 80% of educators would really be interested in testing and vaccination, we're at about 20 or 30% uptick right now and 20% at the student level. We should really want to boost those, both of those constituents up in order to have more of an assuredness um, that our tests are indicative of what is actually happening. Yeah, and I think um, Robin, you can uh, back me up on this, but um, one of the, the schools that's already been doing this for a while, Watertown, is that right? Mm -hmm. they, they were finding that as they started testing, more and more people signed up because folks were beginning to realize, oh, this isn't difficult, this is painless, the turnaround's not fat, you know, it's not a big deal. And then, so then we started getting more information. And then I think that will also add to the comfort level for folks once they just, it's going to take a few rounds for folks to understand how it works and what we're doing. Yeah, I, I agree, Allison. And in fact, I've had a, um, a couple of families reach out to me just in the last 24 hours um, regarding exactly, you know, the the policy, the protocol, I'm not quite sure. I, they had other questions, they had great questions. And Allison and I were thinking about a way um, to reach out to families, perhaps maybe through another avenue um, other than the school committee meetings um, to see if maybe like a Q&A would help or developing like a worksheet that we sent home, something. Allison and I are gonna kind of brainstorm on that. Um, but, you know, not only is it super important to find positive asymptomatic um, students or faculty staff, you know, to stop an outbreak before it happens, right? That's the whole point of this. And um, that's the key. But also, I, I feel like this data is going to help us even in the fall to open schools even better, even more safe. Um, and 
I, I foresee and other districts have said this, they foresee this happening throughout the fall, the testing. Um, children are not going to be vaccinated for at least another year or two. Um, it, it's great that teachers are starting to get vaccinated. Um, but you know, we're, we're going, in my opinion, there's going to be positive cases next fall, next winter. You know, so um, like Allison had mentioned, just getting the program started now, getting people used to the idea, testing, seeing that it's not so bad, seeing that it provides really wonderful data. Um, and I know it, it's hard because then a cohort might have to go home or, you know, and dealing with all that. And that's not easy. That's a lot of um, inconvenience for people and it's a lot of work for people. Um, but I think if this is something that the community wants to keep doing, I think it's something that we can master. I do have a quick question and that is around um, high school students, if about 52% of them are back, do the other 48%, um, I should know this, I should, but are, are the other 48% encouraged to participate or is the, are they discouraged from participating? How does that work? So I think I can, the, the consents went out to everybody and I'm glad you brought this up because some folks might be questioning the math of how does 72 turn into 21% uh, because I took the, who I have is registered and Ms. Commissioner was just talking about Hopkins that people as late as nine o'clock last night were saying, no, I'm gonna come in. But I took the in-person count out of the student information system. And so it's the percentage of in-person learners that have consented. I would say at this, at this initial stage, how we have this set up is that um, we wanna focus on the folks who are physically in the facility because of, of the procedures that we have for collecting the specimens. That's not to say that we wouldn't revisit that. And I'd certainly encourage um, Allison and Robin to talk about this and definitely to talk about it as well with the principals because what does it mean in terms of where it's happening in some cases, we're trying to keep this as um, to go as smoothly as possible, to uh, not interfere with instructional time to the, as much as possible, and um, to grant as much privacy as possible. So we'd be thinking through those things and then say, logistically, what makes sense? So because you, even though forty-eight percent or so may not be back in person learning, they are playing sports with the in-person yep. learners in the afternoon. They're going to club meetings they are interacting with those students. No, agreed. I'll just say for me, I'm, I agree with everybody in that the more people who are participating in testing, the better. I just say at the very beginning of it, and I might be overthinking this, and Allison and Robin might be going, ah, it's a piece of cake. But right now I'm just trying to think through the, just the basic procedural logistics of collecting those specimens in a way that goes smoothly. And that doesn't say that we, we wouldn't open that up once we got that down. But right now I'm just trying to think about that seems like something we'd have to iron out. Yeah. Right? So I agree with your premise. It's just yeah. it's just putting it into action. I think we'd have to think through. I know there's, um, for those kiddos who are home, they come in at noon or whatever, soon, soon after the, the in-person day ends in order to get books or whatever mm -hmm. else the teachers have set up for them. So it could just be dovetailing on a process that's well understood. It's um, a good idea. Yeah. Um, I I like the idea of what Robin said too of trying to make it so that it's an easier venue for parents or students um, to kind of get a little information. I'm wondering even if it's something simple like giving like. Um, sending out an email with like commonly asked questions. And I know we've gone over everything um, and the email has been put out, but it's just specific to that commonly asked questions, maybe misconceptions or concerns that Robin and Allison you're hearing, or maybe Annie or Jen or April are hearing as well, kind of putting that out as like Q and A's like, this is how the test works. Here's some common concerns about it, alleviating any concerns, explaining things that might not be still clear to parents, kind of bulleting it out. And then um, either, again, I don't know who suggested it, um, sending out in that email um, a link with a video of um, showing how it works itself or if Robin's able and willing to do another video and kind of talk through it, whatever that may be and sending it out separately because I think that it, as many people as we can like Paul said as many people as we can to get signed up the better so maybe just sending out 
another email about it, but just specific to that, that gives, you know, Q and A's, the little video, reach out to these points of contacts with any further questions you might have, any concerns you may have. Um, it, I think it would be helpful. It's actually super easy to take an existing video and Robin, you've already done this. The first demonstration was pretty remarkable. I remember we, we all thought it was pretty great for you to just take our existing uh, demo that you did and any Q and A that's been had in that prior meeting, as well as this and create that video that you embed into an email, just send a link. Could be a unlisted YouTube link that has all the relevant information. People are more likely to watch that. I would imagine than read anything. Also the company that we're working with has great materials that explains a lot. And a lot of this has already been created. Um, it's nice to have a familiar face demonstrate, you know, so, but I also know that, you know, we've seen the videos that they've shown us and they are a little sterile, but, you know, very thorough and explain things really well. So we can also use that. I can certainly also, we can follow up to uh, tomorrow and later this week. Allison, Robin, about the best way to maybe schedule something that um, allows us to get questions. And I'm thinking we might actually want to try to encourage people to send questions in advance yeah. um, and then record something that would also allow me to uh, hire interpreters to take whatever Q and A's you were just speaking to each other. And then I can hire people to do those. I'd have to make those accessible in other language. I would want to and need to make those accessible in other languages too. So sometimes Q and A's um, make it really easy for English speakers to get all the information they need and are not as user friendly to those who are not. Um, also, is this something that we could put on the school website rather than sending an email that can get lost? Sure. You, know, yeah. you know, that might be like a portal on the website so people can go there, Q and A for pool testing, yeah. you know, and then that would be a central location. I would say yes and do both. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think both is good because I do think that it can go either way with email. Some people are better off going to a central place and then some people don't even navigate the school page at all, but they'll be good to look at an email. And I think as simple, um, simply explained as it can and very concise and bulleted or, you know, making it as easy for people to understand it without bogging it down with just too much information might be better. And if it warrants further information, they can always reach out and ask for something more detailed or we can provide resources, but making it quick and easy so it doesn't take up a lot of their time, but, you know, hit any points that have come about as their biggest concerns. And thank you both. Yep, agreed. You're welcome. All right, anything else on full testing? That was it. Yes, I echo the thanks. This would not be happening without Allison and Robin. Thank you very, very much. Any family that's happy about this, thank Allison and Robin. Thank you. And thank you, Robin, again for the demo last meeting. It was very helpful. All right, um, next, expectations for in-person learning and consequences for non-compliance. That sounds rather I'm ominous, surprised. doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's not me speaking, but that sounds rather <laughs> ominous, doesn't it? So we haven't received guidance, but on Friday of last week, which was whatever day that was, 8765, right? Um, on March 5th, on Friday, March 5th, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education voted to give the Commissioner of Education the authority to, um, to what? To determine uh, learning models or actually to determine when hybrid and remote learning would not count towards time on learning requirements. So he has been granted the authority to do that. So that means that he can say if a school district has a plan in which, a, for example, uh, a hybrid plan where students are in two days and remote for two days, he has the authority to say that the days that the students are remote don't count toward the district meeting its time on learning requirement. If a district fails to meet its time on learning requirement, what has traditionally been the case is that you have to make those days up, which could extend the school year 
So I used our district as an example. And if the commissioner, this is not, this part is not clear yet. If the commissioner would consider our afternoons uh, hybrid or if the commissioner uh, would still consider this face-to-face, -face, that will probably be much clearer in the guidance. But for the sake of argument, let's say that um, they weren't counted in order to make up that time to get to the 170 or this year, take the, the 850 hours required this year for elementary and 935 required for high school this year, you would be in school till the middle of July. Another thing the commissioner has indicated is that he may, um, he may determine that each day that a school is not face-to-face -face after he has decided that a school should be or a district should be face-to-face -face, that potentially for every day that a district is not in session, that one one eightieth of chapter 70 funding in FY22 would be deducted. That we, if that were ever on the table, that's something that we just, I mean, I'll come out and say, we just wouldn't entertain that here. The town couldn't afford it. Chapter 70 money goes to the town. So the authority that he has been granted is to determine when hybrid and remote no longer count toward required time on learning and the consequences, the possible consequences, although those have not been put in black and white, would be that the time needs to be made up um, and, and or that um, there would be a deduction from chapter 70 funding in fiscal year 22 and next fiscal year chapter 70 funding. We already have the chapter 70 funding for this current fiscal year. We anticipate that we'll have guidance from the state this week that uh, is perhaps a little more specific. And the dates right now that have been discussed, but I again caution everybody to wait and see precisely what is included in the guidance, but that this, that face-to-face -face learning would be, and for us, we already have 100% of our students have access to face-to-face -face learning five days a week. We do our specials, we dismiss early and we do lunch and our specials away from campus in the afternoon at the elementary school. And we do the, the afternoon remotely at the high school as well. Um, right now, if that were no longer allowable um, and it, it's five full days a week, then um, the dates that have been discussed have been a start date of April 5th for elementary schools, May 1st for middle schools, and high schools, there was no date discussed at this point. For us, whatever we do for the middle school, we share staff between the middle school and high school. So it's really, we would look at the middle school date. So that's an update about what was voted, the authorities that he's been granted, the potential consequences, but those have not been finally determined or finalized. And uh, we will be waiting for additional guidance that is supposed to come out this week. I have a question. Sure. It, I, and I'm wondering if I read it wrong or right, but for parents that choose to stay remote, I. I did I read that that was going to be allowable if that's the parent's choice for the rest of this school year? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. So the short answer to that, yes. And the reason is because structured learning time is an, ob is an institutional obligation. It's a school district's obligation. It's not something a, a, the family needs to meet. And he has said that uh, he would make remote learning an option for families that choose it, but the institution is potentially that is going to be taken off the table for institutions to choose, but individual families could exercise that choice. I just didn't want families to get nervous. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Good. Yeah. My dog is intermittently barking in the background, so apologies in advance, but what I've seen um, in so far as a reaction from other school committees across the state is absolute outrage at the commissioners. Um, uh, uh, asserting this power after asking school committees to make responsible decisions and invest the time in um, deciding 
for their own communities, uh, that it feels that there, there's a bit of strong arming that is happening in a sense. Um, and there's a lot of pushback uh, from on the part of other schools. I suspect that the fact that Hadley has had an in-person option and been open since September, October puts us in a different category from other schools that are still, that have been closed since last March. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that there, um, that there may not be the, um, we may not be in the crosshairs uh, as other schools are um, in light of that, but I would not be surprised if we saw more activity around this from the state or the legislature uh, based on their reaction to this. Yes, and I, I, um, I'm glad you brought up Humira that where Hadley is right now. And also remember the plan that we wrote collectively with all kinds of input and thought about and debated, which was good and discussed for a long time. That plan for both schools, the goal was five days, five full days of in-person learning. That was always in our plan. And that was even before we, we knew in August, we did not think that vaccines were gonna be a reality in April. That we really, nobody thought that. Um, I mean, maybe there was some hope, but that wasn't what our plan, we didn't have that as an assumption within that plan because that was, I mean, it's pretty shocking that we've made that much, uh, that quickly that vaccines have come online for COVID-19. So it was always a part of our plan. From day one, we had written into our plan that we were getting to five full days. What we changed at the high school was we talked about how, when we wrote that in August, this idea of just adding this one full day that would arbitrarily fall in a waterfall schedule, like the degree of risk that we introduced for potentially for the gain that we got academically just didn't make sense. Um, and so that's why they've revisited. We talked about limiting variables and, and moving different groups, um, but always to your point, Humara, this was always in Hadley's plan. So this won't be anything that is really going to set our hair on fire, I don't think. But I do know it's, it's quite troubling for many districts. So Andy, what is that plan, plan B if they do say your half day doesn't count or I guess maybe rather than focus on what they're telling to us, what what is our next phase that we're looking for? I know we're entering a new phase, but would we think by May 1st, we could be at full days? Is that, I know we haven't put a timeline on that next phase or really articulated it, but maybe it is something that we can think about. Well, and certainly I think what'll be key, Paul, is, um, so the what, the what was always increasing, um, our goal, again, from August was always about responsibly increasing the amount of face-to-face -face instruction that was possible for students if they chose face-to-face -face instruction. So that's always been in the cards. Your next question of, so could we say that this could happen by um, this date? I think Ms. Camusa and I were talking earlier today and her, so each building has a reopening team, right? And there's a district reopening team, kind of looking at, all right, if the plan that we have, where were we by this date? Where do we think we are going to be by this date? And certainly if the state says, well, we need you to be at this place or else you need to give us, uh, you need to accept the fact that you're going to lose money in FY22 and or your school year is going to continue um, into July, then I think it's, it will just be a question of the faculty coming together and saying, all right, what does this mean? If we have to achieve this, if we have to implement this, what does this mean and what does it do to our timeline? So I don't want to, I, I don't want to answer your question by saying this is exactly what's going to happen on May 1st, because I think, I think what the faculty is going to do in both buildings is say, all right, where do we think we are going to be? If everything progressed like in our introducing movement at the high school and additional blocks, where do we think we would be? We would be. How far is that from where we may be expected to be? And what are we going to do to close that gap, if if that's that expectation? So, but taking the state out of it, if there's teams within each school planning this, what are we going to see in another proposal for the next phase? Uh, yes, I would say that. So. 
I guess the short answer is yes. Yes. I don't know. When I say proposal for that, I don't mean something. We have a plan that we already, we, we already have a plan, right? We have a plan that in August that addressed in-person learning. The reason that we, one of the reasons that we deviated from that was one, looking at, there's a lot of discussion among this group of how many variables do we want to introduce at one time? That was important. Um, and also uh, we started, so there was good news. You remember that discussion that we had at school committee, there was some, some great things that we were reading around the, that school transmission is not, is not the threat or concern that folks thought it might be back in August. But while that good news was happening, there was also a lot of news about variants that are highly contagious and that are new variants. Um, so yes, I suppose I would say that new proposal is looking back at the plan that was built already with faculty input, that was reviewed by school committee saying which elements of this plan have been adjusted and like where, where are we out with this and, and where can we be with this? I, I just want to be clear. I'm not suggesting we're going to come up with a wholesale new uh, proposal for how to do business. Is that? I'm just looking for clarity, Annie. We've got less than three months of school, maybe a little more for some students. And are we, this is the phase or when will we decide when we move into uh, whatever next phase and is that next phase like we'd said back in august which you know i think you're right we shouldn't make things anew but we shouldn't hold ourselves to what we thought in august because clearly we should be a lot smarter now but so august said we would start one full day and then two full days and then three full days right so clearly we don't have enough time to do that before mm -hmm. the end of the year i don't know if that's the smart way to do it what's the risk i mean do we just throw that all out the window and say once all the teachers are vaccinated, then it's a different story, right? If they're all going to start getting vaccinated in a few days, consider that a six week to eight week process. Eight weeks from now, we go back in, you know, so that's the kind of thinking. I'm just curious, when are we going to know this? Because if we're not meeting again for two more weeks, then by the time we have this discussion, school's going to be out. The other question I have is, um, uh, just refresh my memory, Annie, what does phase four look like? Are we talking about kids taking their mask off and eating lunch um, in the schools and being there a full day? Are we? Right. So that, right, the next big elements are introducing lunch. So that's a big element is to introduce lunch, right? And then in the afternoon of the elementary school, some of those specials, we just got the updated guidance, not to say that the only thing you teach in music is singing, but some of those specials had very particular guidance, right, for afternoon specials, not art, but certainly physical education and singing. So it would be lunch and extending the day into the afternoon. At the middle and high school, I mean, back to your point, Paul, I'm not giving this to you as clearly as you would like. So if you're saying, is there a point where we just say, is this a date that we just flip the switch and everything, boom. It's just day, running day at metric. one day, we're just running a completely, and I know you're, you're, I know you're not saying that, but I just, if any, I just want to be completely clear that what we're doing right now, right, the school committee as a group said, we want to see what happens when more students are in the building and they're moving and they're mixing cohorts and we want to pay attention to what happens. Pool testing is going to help us see what happens. Um, that was something that for the most part, the school committee was pretty clear about. We wanna know what happens. And then if we don't notice um, spread or outbreaks, um, then we would increase the number of classes that students were in face-to-face -face and extend the day. Annie, do you want me to jump in a little bit? To... Sure, you'd certainly do better than I'm doing right now, <laughs> Try so please. A couple other things to think about. I still won't give you a definitive answer, uh, but I can okay, give a little, you. a little, a little more, a little more information. So currently, the way I believe, and I don't know if Jen is still in here or not, at HES, it's pretty much adding lunch. At HA phase three, because we were delayed, essentially could go 
through the remainder of the year. However, a lot of this is going to depend on on what the commissioner says, right, in that final guidance, which we're still waiting on. I am preparing to revise the plan that already exists. That's that's what Annie said, right? We're going to use the plans that already exist, which is our three foot in person plan. That was one of our first plans that you guys already approved. Um, so that plan we're thinking is probably closest to what the commissioner is going to want, but we obviously don't know that for sure yet. And that would essentially have mixing of all classes and it would include lunch, but it's possible that there still might be some elements and not others. But I think updating that plan will be helpful to us because pretty much at, at our point, if students, if we can't have student, we have questions right about this cohort model, which is different for the rest of the state. So that's actually one of the questions I, I keep asking uh, Annie about it, as she knows, is to how much that's going to count or not when they're in a cohort and how that's going to work. And so getting clarity on all of those different answers will help us. But we are updating a meeting with Mr. Burns tomorrow, actually, to update the three foot plan based on current enrollment numbers to see where classrooms would be, how many would be more than three feet apart. That way we have that information. But some of this will depend on what it is that we have to do as to how quickly you know, we end up moving forward in some of those other steps. Um, but we'll certainly be prepared. So I, I know, Paul, you're concerned, well, for meeting in an, again in a couple of weeks, would we have it? Sure, we'd have the three foot plan. We could have a version of that because we did all of that work over the summer. So those pieces are pretty easy to update. We just need more specifics from the commissioner about what those requirements for middle school and high school are going to be and when. I guess I would offer maybe what Humara said. We don't necessarily, you know, I think we're all gonna have different perspectives on whether we should let the state drive this. I know that's gonna dictate, it's gonna inform our decision, but we might wanna make our own decisions and move ahead regardless of what the state says. If, of course, if the state binds us, we have to decide there. But if they don't bind us, we still might want to do something different. Yeah, we did talk about that. I looked at the timeline of where weeks are rotating. Uh, and we might think about making a, a suggestion that, you know, might not be in line with whatever projected date there is. That's why I think our, our next best step at Hopkins is to update that three foot plan, because pretty much at this point, if we want all of the students moving, right, if that's the next step where they're not moving middle school one week, high school one week, we have to drop the six feet. So that's our big thing. That being said, uh, I know it's been a while since we've looked, <laughs> looked at all those documents, but we actually still maintain a good amount of space between our students because our classes are so small. So I'll update those numbers so that we have them. I feel like that's our next best step to stay prepared and kind of think about what it is um, that we want to do next. And I'll work on, you know, reviewing all those plans and then, you know, you guys will will decide what you decide. But that's that's where I'm at right now. So I'm just working on updating those things so that we're prepared for any and everything. Great. Thanks. Same at, same at HES. Um, you know, we're gonna just kind of wait to see what the guidelines are around and what our next steps are going to be. We're we're operating uh with about 215 students now, give or take, um, with additional more to come in, in the next couple of weeks. What will be interesting is how we're going to make things like if we were to go to a longer day, what would the commitment be for our teachers to also continuously meet the needs of the remote students? Um, could we have more of a traditional schedule where we would have our specials no longer be remote? So that would drive a change in our, our potential schedule for going from 825 until three o'clock. Um, and then I did speak with Diane Zach today around what kind of options we would have for lunch. Um, would it just be brown bag? Um, would certain classes have to be in their own classrooms to have lunch? Would there be an opportunity to uh, nicer weather with nicer weather be outside in their zones? Cause we already have their zones kind of delineated for outside. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, maybe for the older students, we can open up the gym and the cafe as one huge space um, and, and be very cautious about not mixing cohorts. And so just some of the initial planning, we've had plans where we, we were already kind of looking forward to what is going to happen at the end of this year and, and potentially at the start of next year, um, what were our schedules look like. So 
I think we're in a much better place um, than some other folks in different districts um, because we have we have been looking forward um, and we've always consistently look at, looked forward to see what we're going to be doing. So I'll be meeting with my teams to problem solve around, you know, a recess and our schedules and specials um, in the next couple of weeks. I have, a couple of, I have a couple of things. Um, sure. One is just a question because I don't know the answer. Um, how long are um, snack breaks minute wise compared to lunch breaks? So what we typically had in, in a usual year, um, we would have a 30 minute lunch break, um, 25 to 30 minutes, and then the kids would be able to go outside for recess. Now, what if we wanted to do, and this is one of the ideas we're floating, is that the students have a very quick lunch. Therefore, you know, it's a traditional lunch. You're there to eat, not socialize, and then extend a, a longer recess period outside. So they'd still get the socialization, but for eating purposes, it would just be, you're sitting six feet away from someone and you're, you're opening up your lunch and you're eating and then you get to go socialize. So almost trying to keep it closer to 15, 20 minutes. Our snacks right now are um, snacks in the classroom are six feet apart and it is 15 minutes. Um, so they have a timer, it's 15 minutes then they are able to go outside for their mass breaks. So just a, just a, a thought, a, a couple of things. One, it's great because the warmer weather's coming so you can start to do those, those types of things outside. Um, two, I know you guys are already all thinking about this anyways, but you know, keeping that six foot distance when children have their masks off and eating. So I don't know how that works. And if you're gonna have just lunch in the classroom versus sending kids to the cafeteria, maybe that's something that would be better um, thought about. But then I, I purposely just kind of wanted to ask about the difference in times between a snack break and a lunch. And I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about maybe ways of altering that just to give people thoughts about how different that really is going to look from their snack break. So if we're thinking about cutting back lunch from 30 minutes to 20 minutes, one, is it reasonable for all little kids to have lunch that quickly? I don't know. That's teachers know that best at school. Um, my kid takes forever. Um, you know, it is 20 minutes enough. And then is that, you know, motivation to have them have their reward of having a little bit longer um, recess. And then it's just, it's just not that much difference when you think about 15 versus 20 minutes. And if you're having it in the classroom and they're six feet apart with their masks off or teachers are able to go outside, there's not much of a difference. Um, and I don't know what it looks at the high school, but just in general, like sequentially, as we're moving forward, we always have talked about, you know, introducing one thing at a time and taking incremental steps to make sure that whatever we're implementing is, is safe um, and moving forward. But in general, it is the, the direction that we're going. So not to be the dead horse, um, but, you know, based on past surveys that we've, that we've collected information from staff that may have concerns, this is still the direction that we're moving. So um, who knows the timeline for it, but um, testing can not hurt us. So again, encouraging as many people to test as we're thinking about these steps moving forward to potentially a full school day, all that can do is help us get more information to show that it is what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is safe and appropriate to keep moving forward. So just again, not to beat the dead horse, but anybody that's willing to sign up for the test, do it. Cause it's only going to help us move forward and get back to normal faster. Also, um, we, we know how important and how willing our educators are to get vaccinated. And I'm sure we've all been watching um, that our state resisted allowing teachers to get any priority until the Biden administration um, announced and then CVS opened up vaccine appointments in Massachusetts for teachers just a few days ago. And the very next day, um, our um, governor announced that that would be allowable as of March 11th. There's still questions about teachers taking time off to go do that or find a place. As we all know, it's very difficult to find a place where they can get vaccinated. And so there is, um, a small movement afoot among school committee leaders to write to their legislators asking for um, vaccine um, vac vaccination abilities to come to the schools. So 
so that teachers don't even have to think about that. And uh, I, I wrote to um, Joe Comfort this afternoon asking for a legislature, legislature to um, approve something like that or ask for something like that. And I urge you all to consider doing the same because I think that that would only help um, take all the hurdles out of it for our teachers. It would be a really wonderful thing. And we do have gotten a lot of feedback from teachers. It's like the great vaccine race um, of trying to get themselves signed up. Um, one thing that I'm extremely yes. proud of is the overall collective message from administration um, and from Annie um, saying, if you can get one and it's during school day, we'll cover you um, and I, I'll cover your class. I'll, you know, whatever we can do, that's a priority. Um, and so um, just that message, I think, has made people feel, you know, that this is important and that your health is important. And um, getting this is, is incredibly important for our staff and for our, you know, our families. So I just, I, I think that's a wonderful th message that was sent out last week of if you can get an appointment, we'll cover you and it won't, you know, we'll, if it's 10 o'clock in, in the afternoon, we'll, we'll find somebody to cover your class so you can go get it done. That's terrific. Thank you. You know that support is much appreciated very much. Mm -hmm. Just as a reminder to, um, and I know that it's it's nowhere near there and I don't know what would come to fruition when it comes to testing and availability at the schools, but just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, we probably don't want all of our staff getting vaccinated on the same day um, because if they don't feel well afterwards, you might have no school. <laughs> so just, I, I know that we're not there yet, but something to kind of keep in the back of your mind that, that you know, you wouldn't be able to just have them I don't think it'd be wise of us to have a whole vaccination day all on the same day. Um, if that comes down the line, just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else on this topic? All right. Um, you wanna move into quarantine and isolation guidance, Annie? Yeah, just quickly, because I know at the elementary school um, last week, was it last week? These weeks kind of run into each other. So there was a situation where in a particular grade, we had issued, um, we had issued, indicated that people were close contacts and therefore needed to quarantine because we had somebody who had gotten a positive result on a rapid antigen test. And um, in this case, uh, we learned from the Department of Public Health and actually our local board of health called a state epidemiologist and spoke to two different people and then spoke with me. And so this is new on this chart that I constantly refer people to. Um, but if somebody receives, has a positive antigen test and within 48 hours has a PCR test after that antigen test and that PCR test is negative, then we go with that negative result. And that's what happened, which is why for one grade level, we said, oh, you're close contacts. And then we said, no, you're not close contacts. Because the individual who was person A, who had had a positive test, it's a positive antigen test within 48 hours, had a negative PCR test. And uh, the state epidemiologist was very clear about how we were supposed to interpret that. And we uh, have since, updated the chart to reflect that. Also, there were a lot of questions, understandably, uh, about households. So if a parent is positive for COVID, what does that mean for the students in terms of when does their quarantine start and when does their quarantine end? So that's been clarified in that person B column uh, about how you get released from quarantine that we expect documentation from the contact tracing collaborative or healthcare provider indicating that the close contact has been released from quarantine. I'm talking about this person B. So my mom has COVID and I don't show up as symptomatic. I'm quarantining as a close contact within the household. When does my quarantine start? When does my quarantine end? And um, how do I get released from quarantine? So this has just been updated to reflect that information. This is, uh, it linked in every single newsletter. So if you say, I don't know where that is, 
look in your email, you can look in from a McKenzie, probably in trash, look for newsletter and you will find this every single week. And very good. You can do the dashboard. Yeah, that goes right into the dashboard, yeah. the health data. All right. Okay, so our weekly dashboard. Um, the one thing that we do see is that average daily incidence rate in Hampshire County uh, was up, went down, went back up again, and now appears to be trending downward, which is good. Uh, the testing positivity rate um, is also now heading in the right direction, and we're pleased to see that. I corrected the confirmed cases to reflect um, the one that was positive and then had a negative PCR. Um, so that's what we're looking at in terms of our Hampshire County data and um, in terms of looking more thoroughly, those are the metrics that the school committee uses, but in terms of looking at all of the CDC recommendations, now again, the CDC, the new guidance, they ask you to look at these things in seven day, I kept that 14 days there because those are the data that are published. Um, and so uh, until our Department of Public Health starts publishing the data on 14 days, I'm not gonna do a hand count data entry every week. It's too likely that I would do a data entry error, just make a, a simple mistake. So you can also see um, in the core indicators and the secondary indicators what's happening in the region. Across the state, we're seeing things are beginning to look much better, which is great news. Great, thank you. Sure. Any questions or comments on the review of the data or the quarantine isolation guidance? Okay. All right, um, we're gonna move then into the school committee reports, the next section. Uh, so Humera, anything on the collaborative? We haven't had a, a meeting since the last time, although uh, the last meeting I mentioned asking about Spiffy and it, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that they had plans at that time, but they uh, found the person who reports on that and had them uh, confirm that they would uh, invest in having um, this be an on year for Spiffy, which is an every other year thing. And by now, most of you have gotten an email in your inbox from um, Hadley Public Schools notifying you that your um, child, if they are in, is it eighth, 10th and 12th grade? That's correct. Right, yes. will be surveyed, students can opt um, not to, but it's gonna give us very important data we need about the um, mental health of our students. So. Um, we're excited for all students and families to participate in that, students at least, students to participate in that, um, which happens during class time, I believe, with an activity for those students who are not participating in it. Um, so that's good news that we are mm -hmm. on our way to data that we can compare to a, a previous year's baseline. Another piece of good news is that the um, search for an executive director is well underway um, and they had 80 applications for uh, at, at first blush. Um, Annie knows this full well because she's in the phase one search screening committee and um, so I think it's on to the next step where you've winnowed down the process and um, the team that reviews the um, semi-finalists are um, ramping up their uh, effort. Um, beyond that there are a number of great programs coming up um, I'll forward you the most recent newsletter team members so you can see what some of those programs are. And you, Mary, I'm just going to tell people I had to look it up because I can never remember. SPIFI stands for the Strategic Planning Initiative for Families and Youth. I realize how crazy that must sound to people who've never heard of it. So it's a group that works at the Collaborative for Educational Services on supporting families and youth and mental health and many other and healthy behaviors in the region. Only as crazy as Dibbles. I mean, Spiffy and Dibbles. That's right. All those are your favorites, right? <laughs> yes, I'm so glad we got to mention both of those tonight. It's wonderful. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Thanks, Sumera. And Annie, I'm glad to hear you're on that um, search committee, the selection committee. That's great to hear. Got the inside, inside scoop. All right, uh, finance. Ethan, any updates on that? I'll, I'll give a, a couple of quick updates. Annie, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we do have a, a meeting coming up on the 17th. Um, but just for notes and for purposes, uh, the school department has submitted a local contribution level funding request for fiscal year 21, or I'm sorry, fiscal year 22. Uh, the school committee, as we talked about, voted to return the $375,000 to the town for, for this year. Um, there will be a public hearing uh, on the school department budget scheduled for April 26th. And the annual town meeting, which was first scheduled for May 6th, has been moved. That date is yet to be determined. It will be outside. All right. And policy will resume in March. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Any announcements for tonight? I know um, Jane Nevin Smith. Yep. You are on and you have been made co host. If there's anything you'd like to share, nothing. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks. Thanks again for attending. Anything from my uh, fellow school committee members? I just have a, a few things. One, um, for Hadley Learns, we had a great session on micro microaggressions and how microaggressions contribute to um, uh, or take away from a culture of belonging, um, both in the schools as well as in the community. Um, it was a, a great session. Um, and we are planning one. Uh, they're held the first Thursdays of the month, HadleyLearns.com. You can find out more information about it. But the next topic is um, US housing discrimination and local Hadley housing policy. So for anyone who's interested in that, it seems to be a hot topic. We have a pretty great program uh, lining up for that. Um, and then the um, only other thing that I wanted to say is that um, there was a tragic loss um, in the community, uh, the father of um, uh, for uh, Hadley Public Schools students. Um, and they are raising, the, the oldest son posted a GoFundMe, raising um, money for his father's funeral. They are about $600 shy of meeting their goal uh, for funeral expenses. So if anyone's interested in contributing, please email me. Uh, the easiest thing to remember is humera at humera.com. Uh, I'll email you the GoFundMe link if you do not have it handy. Thanks, Tamara. Anything else, folks? OK. Um, we do have some approvals. Uh, we've got the minutes from February 1st. Any revisions or requests for that? Is there a motion to approve the minutes from February 1st? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We already discussed the program of studies, so then the approval of the accounts payable warrants for the month of February. Can I just pause for one second here? This will also allow me to make an announcement, which we've done before. Um, but on the AP warrants, as you know, uh, Heather, you always abstain. Paul, you can participate in the AP warrants. Um, and uh, then, Paul, you will abstain from D, approval of warrants, all warrants. The reason for this, just to remind folks, is Allison Willette is working for the school department as a testing supervisor for our program. So the conflict of interest law means that you abstain on 8D and we're announcing it again to the community that uh, that connection, but uh, Paul Pfeiffer will abstain from any votes in which uh, a member of his household has a financial interest. Thanks, Annie. Yep, thanks, Annie. But you do get a vote on this one. AP, yes. Second one, no. Or abstain. Okay. <laughs> so AP accounts payable. These are vendors' uh, payments. Um, uh, if there's a motion to approve the AP warrants for the month of February. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I will abstain. Uh, and then the approval of the uh, payroll warrants for month of February. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. 
All right. Um, so if we could talk about our next meeting date, there was a request to see if we could shift our next meeting date one week later, which is March 29th. And also, um, if we can discuss, you know, we typically meet uh, the last or the fourth, every fourth Monday. Um, are folks prepared to shift back into that schedule at this point with a, a meeting on March 29th and then reconvening again at our regular meeting uh, in April? What do folks think about that? Are you saying going back to once a month? Yes. I was gonna actually suggest that. <laughs> so. there's, and there's nothing that prevents you, of course, from holding Mondays for anything that could potentially come up. I mean, I would just suggest as you're talking about this, to doesn't mean you have to assume, but if you can avoid Mondays in the event that there, that something occurred, right? That we got some news from the state or something that seems right. to be a safe, but um, yeah, I think people know how to access the public health data now. They, um, I think that's a reasonable request in light of the fact that it's still a pandemic. So can I, so we would meet again, March, end of March? March 29th. Um, it, it, we're supposed to meet March 22nd. There was a request just based on availability and schedules if we could push that one week to March 29th. And, and then, Paul, if, if the request to, based on some of the earlier discussion about Hopkins and future of phases and you know having that on the agenda, I think seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to be talking about end of March, especially if we're not going to meet again until the end of April. Okay, I just, I'm worried, right, that we're not gonna have a chance to discuss moving into another phase if we think it's appropriate. So at the end of March, or we will talk about some of the ideas. Are we gonna vote on something? Cause then we won't vote again until the end of April, which is, mm -hmm. as you know, Heather, for the seniors, basically the end of school, we will have a few weeks after that. My is guess is way? you'd probably oh, be voting something on 329. If in fact, I think, and, and this, this, we may decide when we see the guidance that, oh dear, you know, maybe we, we spoke too soon here, but if the timelines are what he's saying the timelines are, then that means on April 5th, it's a game changer for elementary schools. So yeah, you would be looking at some things on March 29th, I would imagine. I think that would be clear this week and, and across the board, we wouldn't want to piecemeal that, right? So. Um, okay. So you feel comfortable by, by then, Annie, we will have that direction from the state. We have oh to. yeah, I believe we'll have it. I, I believe we'll have it this week. I mean, April okay. 5th is right around the corner. Right. And there, okay. I think this is really a very different ball game for us. I mean, think about districts where nobody's been on site. Maybe 10 yeah. kids have been on site all year. So yeah, yeah he'll, the guidance okay. will be out this week. Otherwise it, it won't, they won't be able to make it happen. Okay. I, I would actually anticipate too, though, that if the guidance comes back that on April 5th, elementary school needs to be back, you know, full days that we probably wouldn't want to wait till the 29th. That would only be a week before, if it happens on April 5th, that would only be a week before. So there's the potential for us to need to meet in between now and then if there were some drastic changes. To the so schedule. maybe that's not a regular meeting. It's more of an emergency meeting that's focused just on reopening plan and um, based on guidance from the state? I'm asking Annie, I mean. Yeah, so, and I'm the one that has a potential problem on the 22nd. So I will look at that. Um, as soon as we get that guidance, I think our first step is to see how, what it means for us, right? What's required uh, by when and how much of a, of a fundamental change is it from the direction we were planning on going anyways. Um, and then maybe if it's, even if it's um, potentially not the, even if it's uh, Wednesday later in that week, it was, it was my request if at all possible to be flexible on that date on Monday the 22nd. Yeah, and I, I think I just mean that if there's very clear guidance and mm -hmm. there's a hard stop that April 5th kids are going back, then I just don't, I wouldn't want us to wait another two and a half weeks to tell parents, hey, kids are back full time next week. I'd want to Mm -hmm. talk about that sooner, whatever day of the week it would be. Sure. So what would you prefer, Annie? Do you want us to lock in the 29th, but then plan accordingly based on what we see this week? Or yeah, I mean, I that week of the 22nd, just to get it earlier. Um, 
So I would like this, if we could lock in on the 29th and um, I'm not 100% sure that I, that I need to ask you this, this for the 22nd. So if we needed another meeting, maybe I could email and get a date that works later in that week if that's what we needed or, or, or maybe I could make the 22nd one if okay. we had to. But can we plan the regular March meeting to be on the 29th, barring um, some need for... Does that work for folks? I'm seeing nodding, so. Yep. Paul, does that work for you? The 29th? Okay. All right. So let's plan on the 29th for our regular meeting and then we can meet earlier, um, a different earlier than the 29th as, uh, as dictated by the new guidelines and kind of the need uh, to get information out. And, and I just like to add that I don't know what having a meeting once a month really looks and feels like guys. No. That's, that's news to me. Remember the days? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> It'll happen again. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I think we have reached the conclusion of our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thanks, have, a good yeah. night. have a great night, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.